Welcome to the Detroit Lions News Show, your number one source for Detroit Lions news. But when I see Dan Campbell handling the clock the way he has over the last three years, same shit with fourth down going for it, admitting after the after the game that, yeah, you know what, our defense played pretty well, but, you know, we put him in bad spots. Whose fucking fault is that, buddy? That's a turnover, I'm sorry, especially in your own freaking side. Don't play that way, Dan. I hope you're listening. Don't coach that way. So Darcy's on with us pre-show, talking about how he's ready, he's ready for the end of the Wow. Yeah, you got to continue to do the work. You know, there is a lot of hype and there is a lot of the media involved now. And Jameer Gibbs, guys, you're going to fall in love with them because golf's going to find him in the slot. He's going to get a lot of screen passes. I've been following the, you know, the Lions. I mean, that's that's my team, man. I mean, you know, they're the team that, 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 that drafted me and gave me a chance to play, you know, play the NFL. Finally talking Lions in the playoffs. We've got a Stafford angle, Aaron Donald angle. We didn't draft Aaron Donald, we took Eric Ebron. I, I want no to kill him. No. Detroit fans, players, I got my jersey right there. I got my number right there. Let's, hey, let's get it cheering, man. It's time for y'all to start cheering right now. Super Bowl, Super Bowl. That's right. Let's go. Here we guys are. Every The guys are here two weeks out from the NFL draft. We got the crew assembled. It's going to be a good talk, getting a sense with everybody regarding where this football team is at with the draft, what they're hearing, all the cornerbacks that are coming to town. Looking forward to catching up with everybody, seeing where they're at, what they're liking with Walt, Joe, Kurt. Everybody's here. We got the crew. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Uh, definitely going to hit on the draft, what we're looking at in the first round, probably some sleepers that potentially could make this football team better. And that's the name of the game. This football team is poised to add talent to a roster that has starters all over the place. And yeah, they have a lot of needs. They have areas of depth that they need to address, and they're going to do that. What everybody's excited about and relaxed about, everybody's sitting pretty, sitting confident, about this football team is because Brad Holmes has done the work in his first three drafts and free agency to put together a playoff roster. Now the key is going to be taking and moving this football team to the next level. And that's going to be the challenge with this draft is that you got to find players that have the potential to contribute this year in a deep playoff run. But also there are going to be a couple picks like Broderick Martin that are going to be stashed away and not see the field and develop. And I see more of the same from Brad Holmes. And I think everybody can sit here and feel confident heading into the draft. So we'll start with that. Where's everybody's mindset going into the draft? I know I'm relaxed. Everybody's looking at now big boards, looking at talent at different positions. And today is a national holiday for all the draft nerds because the beast came out. If you're a subscriber of The Athletic, Dane Brugler is a wild man. 18 months to fill in all the positions out. I'm talking about every piece of information that you probably need for the draft is there in one spot. And it's a great resource for everybody that wants to pay attention to the draft. But I'm sitting comfortable. I'm excited regarding what the Lions can do. Outside of shock, another running back or quarterback, I'm comfortable with whatever Brad Holmes decides, whether it be cornerback, whether it be uh, offensive lineman, wide receiver, if they can get a lucky uh, one of the top edge rushers, whatever Brad Holmes decides to do, trade up, trade down, within the framework of this football team, you understand there's a reason, and he's earned the benefit of the doubt that, hey, he's going to do the job and make this football team better. Kurt, where are you standing with this football team? Now, two weeks from the draft, we're, we're right around the corner uh, in Detroit. The NFL draft is coming. Well, I had to say – pretty like it's relaxing i'm not like really stressed about the draft like you said one thing i would say it's the Lions can do whatever they want to do best player available uh they can fill some needs the one thing like you said with broderick, broderick martin you're gonna have some guys that's gonna get drafted 
by Detroit that's not going to see the field or in a limited capacity. If you look at the uh, the depth of the roster at the top of it, you have a lot of roster spots that are filled. You don't have a lot of needs at starting positions. Uh, you can do whatever you want to do. You can rebuild the offensive line. You can find a guy that's going to be a starter and sit behind a guy like a Taylor Decker or a Graham Glasgow or a Zeitler. You can uh, find a uh, a guy that's going to uh, sit uh, behind the couple of the safeties that we have with Iffy and and Joe, uh, Kirby Joseph, excuse me. Or you know you can uh, you can go up and get that corner that you're going to be looking at at the end of that. Uh, first round we got all of them coming into town right now seems like all the the top corners are making a visit to detroit so i mean and you have the um, uh, cd3 and you have um a meek so what are you gonna do uh with those guys something somebody's not gonna be starting in detroit whoever we whoever we have it might be a uh, area where brad holmes may be looking at moving up the draft a guy because some of the guys in those later rounds and those picks aren't going to make the team. So why you waste that pick and go up and trade it and get somebody you may be uh, looking for to pick up in the first round of the draft. Yeah, I agree. I think currently they have the ability to do pretty much whatever they want, go in any direction they choose. They invested. I thought, at least I felt now looking back on it at that point in time, I didn't really agree with it for the first couple of days, but now that I look at it, Carlton Davis and Meek Robertson, those guys are two complete upgrades to the secondary of what we had last year. Now, are they big-time players? Maybe not, but they are complete upgrades over what we had. So you have to be happy with that moving forward. And it leaves a lot of flexibility in draft considering the fact that we could still go corner because I believe corner is still a need. Edge rusher, D-tackle, linebacker, uh, pass rushing linebacker, if you choose to go with a guy like that for different scheme sets. Um, wide receiver there's a lot of different directions they could go they could also trade back and package up some picks get more offensive line help if they have a couple guys on the interior of the defensive line that they really like they could double down get both of those chicago did it a year ago matter of fact with two of the d um, nose tackles that they drafted one from florida and one from south carolina i believe so they've got a lot of different directions they could go in um also, I think something people haven't really talked about a lot around here is there's a lot of elite talent in this draft. I've already started on 2025. 2025 is kind of lean right now. I think as far as the high-end talent, leaner than anything I believe we've seen over the past 10 years. Like usually the upcoming summer, you've got about a good 15 to 20 names that you already know, concrete guys that could have been first round picks the prior year, chose to go back. It's not a lot of that right now. If you look at a guy like maybe Harold Perkins from LSU, um, there's an no, uh, offensive tackle from Texas whose name kind of slips my mind right now. But they're in the quarterback position. That's why I'm glad we're not looking for a quarterback. Because quarterback gets kind of lean next year. And we have Jared Goff. He may not be everyone's cup of tea, but he's one of the top quarterbacks in the league right now. He's perfect for us heading into year four in the same exact offense so you can't expect him to do anything but continue to ascend but like i said 2025 is a situation where we could say screw the picks let's say they want to move up and get somebody you can obviously do it you can keep pick 29 and if you want a guy bad enough say it's an edge rusher or it's a corner a guy like queen Yon mitchell a dallas turner or whatever this team could possibly look at this draft and say you know what we're going to go for the fences. We're going to get two elite players in the first round. If we only end up with four or five picks in this draft, so be it. To me, it's about quality, not quantity. And if we can get two potential cornerstone players in a corner and an edge rusher or a corner and a D tackle, however you want to put it, this is a team moving forward that's probably set up to win from year six through 10 now. Yeah, I agree with you with what you all said. I think that this is going to be an interesting draft because I, I really don't think that they're going to stay at 29. Either they're going to move back or they're going to move forward. I kind of have an inkling that they are going to trade up, though. That's my opinion. I think that if the, if if there's two positions, I think that they're going to go in the first round. I think you could potentially see – I think wide receiver is definitely on the board and cornerback is definitely on the board. 
I mean, if you if you you got to think about it this way, Buffalo just they have no wide receivers right now. So if you're trying to get a wide receiver, you got to get in front of Buffalo. And then, and if you want a cornerback, a good cornerback, you're probably gonna have to jump some people because there's gonna be a lot of people looking for corners. So, I mean, it's kind of like what, what would you rather do? But like like Walt said, this is the next year's draft is kind of lean. I mean, Quinn Ewers is coming up. Don't hurt hit on my boy, but that draft is going to suck. So if he trades a first round pick from next for next year, I mean, that's potential too. Cause I think that this draft mm-hmm. is good. And you yeah, expect yeah, to good. be picking somewhere between 27 and, and 32, hopefully again, if you're and Detroit. So what does, what it the matter? Hell does it really I'm matter? Saying, exactly. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So. Your, your first round is, is essentially a second rounder anyway. If, you, if yeah. you're yep. picking, you know, that he got that less, you know, he got, he comes from that less need. You know, school of drafting. You know, what I'm saying where that end of the first round, Eftem picks. They they trade in those those uh, first round picks because they're basically a second round pick anyway. So, do you, you think know, he I, would use that to go get like a guy like uh, like let's say like after the draft he uses that first round pick for Marshawn Lattimore? Because I think that's totally on the table. Because if you look at the Lattimore's contract breakdown, he can't be traded before June first because I think it's like a thirty million dollar cap hit for the. Uh, it's the Saints, but after that, it goes down. After June first, it goes down to like I think it's like nine million for the Saints, and they need to shed some payroll. And that's one of the guys that's been mentioned. I was listening to uh, some New Orleans people talk, and they were like, "Yeah, Lattimore is going to be gone. Someone's going to be gone. That's a high price guy." And they keep mentioning Detroit as the guy, that, the team that's going to get Lattimore because Aaron Glenn knows him, Dan Campbell knows him. Um, there was someone else that knows him too. So that's. That's kind of like why I'm getting that gist of Lattimore. So I could see where they – if it, if it's in the first round and they say, okay, we expect to go get Lattimore, I could see them saying, all right, well, let's go get Brian Thomas from LSU. Or, mm. you know, because I think that if you wait too long, because you see what – you see Buffalo is ahead of you, and they have no wide receivers right now. Gabe Davis went to Jacksonville. Stefan Diggs went to Houston. Him and his, you know, his, uh, his pouting ass. And everyone, you know, so they don't have anybody. They have two tight ends that are good, and they don't have no wide receivers. If you, I mean, Shakir is kind of good, but he's not going to scare you. Well, I have a quick question about that. Like, is mm-hmm. is offensive line on the board twice? Because if you look at the current situation right now, we're going to eventually need Frank's replacement. You know, he's yep. in a situation. He's Calvin Johnson now. He's not going to practice at all. He's going to show up, and he's going to be all pro on Sundays. How much longer does Frank really want to put his body through that? We're going to probably yeah. eventually need a new left tackle if you intend on keeping Panay at right tackle, yeah. which I think is probably the smart thing to do, even though he's great enough to do either. And you're going to eventually need another left tackle. Zeitler's a, a serious vet. Glasgow's a vet. Source Doll, you're hoping that Source Doll becomes one of those late round diamonds that becomes something, but. We could use a couple of young infusions of blood on that offensive line. And I was mm-hmm. talking to someone the other day about Jackson Powers Johnson and how I'm not buying like the top 15 hype behind it because typically they just don't respect centers that much. I believe he could fall because if we look at the past, what, three or four centers, I believe, that have all been drafted in the first round, wasn't Frank like the highest drafted one out of all of them? Because the guy Kelly from the Colts, I believe, was, I think, between 17 and 23, if I'm not mistaken. These are all turned out to be great players, but for whatever reason, the NFL, they just don't respect them like that. So right. there's a possibility a guy like Powers Johnson could fall to 29. I absolutely believe he's on the board. And I could see them with the way the skill position guys, the receivers, as deeper as that, as that class is, um, as deep as the defensive backs class is, safety and corner overall, we could find ourselves with our pick of the number one center and number one guard in this class. And that's going right. to be really hard to turn down. No doubt. And on my latest podcast, that's what I said was, I thought that when you look at what's going on with the offensive line, the depth too, the international player, Max Percher signed with the Seahawks. So you don't have a lot of depth uh, in regards to, the offensive line. You got Dan Skipper, A. Wosika. You have opportunities for younger guys, and you have Colby Sorsdahl. But in terms of starting caliber talent, 
I think, too, the, the Duke player, Graham Barton, is a guy that's yeah. been mocked in a lot of mock drafts. So if he's there, he's also on the board and, and is a good player. So to me, I could see two offensive linemen in this draft because you have three literally and i think that that is a little bit of my only concern outside of cornerback this year is you got three offensive linemen in their 30s and frank rag now who is basically day-to-day in regards to the maintenance of his foot injury now he's been reliable and he's been out there but you don't know how much that's going to respond all throughout the year and many people are saying maybe 2024 could be his last year now you look at that offensive line, it's solid and it kind of has the win now feel of a unit that is going to be counted upon with Ben Johnson, potentially maybe his last year as well. So offensive line definitely is on the board. Powers Johnson maybe is the player if Joe is right and they move up. Mm-hmm. That's would be an interesting reaction to see how the fans would react to trade up for a lineman. So listen, yeah. I, I, it's a key position and you see, what uh, Mr. Wiggins has to say is, is the concrete won't get so, won't get solid if you keep adding water. The foundation is first, and Brad Holmes has been shown to really respect yeah. the trenches and go there. So it's going to be real interesting. That's what uh, is going to be interesting to, to see is what if a couple players are in, in that same boat. So in my mind, all right. So I'll ask. I'll, I'll put it to the group. If you have Darius Robinson there, the edge, the talented edge rusher available who's been in town for a top 30 visit or you have graham barton or powers johnson you have a line a choice between a lineman or an edge rusher where do you go in terms of brad home selection what would you prioritize between those two positions uh i to be honest with you i probably would go powers johnson just to be honest Mm. with you I, i want that i want that cornerstone piece that can replace some one of the guys that we have now um, but there is talent, you know, for offensive linemen. This is not a, a light draft for them. It's, it's some mid to late round guys that, that you can look at. Um, one of the guys I was looking at was one of the, um, from Graham, excuse me, from, uh, Frank Ragnall's alma mater, uh, was that Bo Limer, uh, the center slash guard. I mean, you have some guys that can, that you can get, uh, mid to late rounds, but, um, I like that. I like the cornerstone, uh, and this could be a draft uh, where you can rebuild the offensive line, where you can add depth, and then once the older guys, the vets, start to matriculate out, you can just push those guys up to, and have them start. Yeah, um, I agree. I personally would go Powers Johnson as well. I just think he's that elite of a, of a prospect, and when you compare the fact that you need center help, interior offensive line mm-hmm. help, as well as versatility on the defensive line comparing the prospects just doesn't even out for me i don't consider darius robinson to be the type of prospect the caliber prospect that uh powers johnson is i'm going with the center i'm going with powers johnson in that situation when i look at it for what it is i can find impact help in the front seven on defense mid rounds of the draft later on in the draft i can find those types of guys those darius robinson guys later on in the draft may not necessarily be his size or his type of versatility but i think we've seen a lot of this before and you know you look at darius robinson he's a guy who 6'5 285 has the body has the frame flash the athleticism really put it all together this season and i just get like these keon white feelings from him you know, a guy who kind of was a, a, um, a high riser late, came on strong, has a lot of measurables, and people see a big ball of clay with it. And I think sometimes you can fall in love with that, and it just never materializes into what you envision. Even Tyree Wilson from a year ago. Like, I was a guy that was not really that high on him at all, but I understood people saw the, the athleticism, the size, the measurables and whatnot, and what they felt he could be. Now, he struggled with the Raiders for the most part of the season, got healthy, and played better as the season went on. But I just, in that situation, I'm going with the more established player, the better player, I believe, and that's Jackson Powers Johnson. Yeah, I'm going I'm going Darius Robinson. Here's a couple of reasons why. I, I know a lot of people, you guys like Jackson Powers Johnson, and I, I like him too. Uh, he's always great. All his stats, they grade out well. He did well at Oregon, obviously, but I look at Darius Robinson and I look at him and he had 18 pass win percentage. Okay. So 18% pass win percentage is pretty high. 
Also, when I look at center in this draft, there's a lot of centers that are that could be available. And you were mentioning earlier about Graham Barton. Here's why I don't think Graham Barton or any guard would be on the table in the first round. Because I know that they had I know that this franchise really values Kobe Sorstall. And I know that there are scouts out there that said that when you draft a guy from like William and Mary or some smaller school, you basically got to give him a year to get get right. So I, I know that the Lions are like, okay, they have high hopes in him. Do I think they're going to go after a guard? Yes. Maybe you go after a Zach Zenner who's already on like that kind of like uh, he's going to be on that IR plan anyway. So you can kind of stash him for a while. But I just look at Darius Robinson I, and I look at that defensive line that they had they put together with DJ Reader and Ali McNeil and Aiden Hutchinson. And then you add in a James Houston that's coming off the bench. I think that's better suited for this team because, look, if they don't get a cornerback in this draft, what's the one thing that helps out a corner, uh, uh, a pass defense? Pass rush. So if you can get a pass rusher like Darius, uh, you know, like him, you're going to be good. I think that they need to find a, another edge rusher to Aiden Hutchinson. They cannot rely on Marcus Davenport. I know there's a lot of Lions fans. I've heard them in the comments uh, on my page, Detroit Lions News that they're so excited about Marcus Davenport and maybe that he can reclimate to what he was a couple years ago, but he hasn't stayed healthy. And you're asking James Houston, and then, you know, there's also Lions fans that want to draft Chop Robinson, which I said, what are they trying to build? A daycare center of defense events? Yeah, no doubt. You got to go Darius Robinson, in my opinion. Yeah, no doubt. I think it's interesting in regards to um the edge rushers that maybe could be taken later on in the draft you got to remember seven picks i do think that brad holmes will be active maybe get that third rounder that they don't have uh, i think uh in this year's draft so i look at the the priority prioritization of needs and i'm wondering is brad holmes willing to gamble on a wide receiver to make it elite would you go out and get a, a keon coleman leg it would you go out there and fortify a position of strength and you've seen in terms of what Brad Holmes is willing and capable of you saw that he traded up for Jamison Williams made the move for Jameer Gibbs you know he loves the Alabama talent who did he go out there to scout was it Kool-Aid McKinstry was it for Terry and Arnold was it for a wide out so it's going to be fascinating to see if you know Brad Holmes rolls the dice on offense even though like you said there are areas of need and that's what he said clearly he said look we go best player available and he said if you don't do that you might miss out on the key word he said impact players and there are some impact wideouts out there in the first round so i wouldn't be surprised if he looked at wideout so that's what's going to be interesting and th they've done just as much work on the wideouts as they have on the cornerback. So it's going to be interesting in that they both could be slotted either early or on day two or three. So that's what's going to be fun is to find out and discover what did he prioritize, which player did he end up valuing more, and we're going to start to get some of those clues this year. And you look at some of the opportunities that the Lions have to make trades. I think there might be even a realistic chance that, you know, similar to what Mike Fisher says, maybe he'll trade down uh, trade out of number 61, get more picks later on. So it'll be very fascinating to see how Brad Holmes approached the tenor of this draft. Are there any sleepers that you guys have paid attention to? I know on All Lions, uh, my guy, my writer, really kind of uh, surprised me a little bit, looked at and scouted the BYU offensive tackle in Kingsley. Uh, I'm going to butcher this. Kingsley Suomataya. From BYU, he really found that, you know what, maybe the replacement for Taylor Decker needs to be targeted. Look, guys, I know it's a taboo subject in regards to Taylor Decker whenever any publication looks at his contract. But it was um, it was interesting. It was a blurb in a mock draft from the 33rd team. And I know that it wasn't a name writer. It wasn't somebody that has a big name. But he kind of said that, you know, there's whispers that that $19 million cap fit hit for Taylor Decker could be looked at by the Lions. Now, I would be shocked if they did end up moving on from him or trading him. But at the same token, I, I, don't, I wouldn't put it past 
Because remember what Brad Holmes said, don't be shocked at our decisions because we are looking for continuity. We're looking for the future. And Taylor Decker on the last year of his deal, I think he plays it out. I think that they don't move on from Taylor Decker this year, but you have to start to look at his replacement. So pay attention to that. Maybe a tackle that is uh, potentially out there to protect Jared Goff in the future. Because you got to remember, if Jared Goff gets a four or five year extension, the most important position is his blind spot. And maybe you move Panay Sewell there and you know the guy's going to be a natural right tackle, but there could be a tackle uh, on the board. There could be a tackle in the Lions' future in this year's draft. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, a tackle, yeah. Uh, like I said, I said earlier, you can rebuild your offensive line in this draft. You can get uh, some guys that can come in and uh, sit behind a veteran like Taylor Decker or one of the guards and then move up uh, into a starting position next year. Uh, you look at that, um, I know there's a confusion. People were talking about, well, Taylor Dicker's only got another year in his contract. No, 2025 is a void year. We you know how Brad Holmes and his his um, his capologists, they structure those deals like that where they can go ahead and move on um, with that voided year. So I don't see them moving off on Taylor Dicker this year, but you can draft a tackle, and um, I'm – I haven't really looked at some of the the, the tackles down the line, but um, as far as uh, day two or day three, but you could find a good tackle. The offensive line depth, like I said, in this draft is very deep. So you can find what you need uh, in this draft as far as offensive linemen is, is concerned. Yeah, so as far as um, depth is concerned with this draft, depends on what you're looking for. That's why I'm not really too big on taking a wide receiver in the first round. I think you can get a guy like Jamari Thrash, who's very Jared Goff friendly. To say, to say the least, he's a guy that gets open consistently. One of the best route runners in this class. Performed really well at Jackson State before he transferred over to L, not LSU, but uh, Louisville. Can run every route that you need him to run. Very solid at the point of attack when it comes to catching the football. He's good after the catch. He's almost a St. Brown clone. I just think he's more advanced as a route runner coming out than St. Brown was. So he's a guy that you can probably get early third round. Um, if we move around the board, I think running back is also a position that if the quality is there, sixth round, uh, maybe even, even the fifth round. Don't they have, what, two picks in the fifth, if I'm not mistaken? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So – Running back to some fans may say, hey, you know, we got Jameer mm. Gibbs. We spent the first round pick on him. We got Montgomery. Montgomery, if we're just being honest about the, the lifestyle of the NFL, Montgomery probably after 2024, 20, maybe one more year here, simply because you're talking about paying a lot of people. And in a lot of cases, running backs get hurt. They get cut in a lot of those types of situations. So, and I've said before, if it was up to me, considering the current state of how running backs get treated in the league, I would probably draft a running back late every year, if not every other year, simply because it's cheap labor now. And that may sound horrible, but, you know, they get these young running backs fresh out of college. And I'm a big advocate, honestly, now, with the way running backs get treated and the way the market is. As a running back coming out of college, you need to get out of college as soon as possible. Stay as healthy as you can get as few carries, make sure by the time you get to the NFL, the NFL is going to get the best years of your career, not college. The days, I believe, of running backs toting the football 500 carries a season in college is over with, especially yeah. if you consider the way these teams are, are using running backs by committee. So I think there is a lot of running backs deep in this draft that you put behind our offensive line. And that's the thing. We don't necessarily need a, a dynamic superstar generational talent. You can take a guy like Mayan Williams from um, Ohio State, who I actually like a lot, even though he's a Buckeye. But, you know, Marshawn Lloyd of USC. Like, there's a lot of quality running backs, versatile guys that you can put behind this offensive line that those young guys will do the same thing. So if you're just thinking forward, you're talking about offensive line, of course, there's plenty of guard help. A guy like Cooper BB who could be there early third, maybe late second, depending on how these teams really start to feel about them throughout the entire draft process. But there's so much depth. There's so much depth to the point that you could get the number one safety in the class, honestly, at 29. 
or early second round, you know, and that pretty much comes down to the fact that they devalue safeties also. But like I said, you know, it's offensive line. There's plenty of depth, especially on the interior running back quality. I, I feel there's plenty of depth cornerbacks, defensive backs in general, the versatility guys who can play corner and safety. It's just there. It's there this year. I felt last year the cornerback position should have been addressed. There was a lot of elite talent in last year's class. Uh, they decided to walk away from that draft with no corners at all, which I thought was strange. But this year, you need to go get it. There's plenty of guys, even Cooper DeGene, who I felt is really one of their type of guys. You're talking about a guy who can play. Depending on what the matchup is, I believe he can play on the perimeter. Now, do I believe, can he run the gauntlet like Cam Sutton got put through the gauntlet of C.D. Lambs and, and all these guys on a, a six to seven week basis? No. But I do believe Cooper DeGene can match up on the outside against some receivers. I think he can play in the slot. I think he can play safety. I think he's a very smart football player. And he's their player. I honestly believe it. So it wouldn't shock me if he was a guy that went at 29 as well. Yeah, Cooper DeGene also has a high RAS score, which we know that Brett Holmes loves the RAS scores to a T. You know, you mentioned wide receiver. Uh, John, and I'm going to tell you this right now. If they're going to trade up for any player in particular, it's going to be a wide receiver, and it's going to be I, – I would bet any money to be Brian Thomas because my feeling about this is – I know a lot of you I know a lot of you guys are going, let's go cornerback. Well, I think that there's a lot of corners that could be had in the third, the fourth, the fifth round that could be really helpful. Like one of the guys that I'm, I look at with this, this, uh, this, this draft is Josh Wallace from Michigan. You look at his stats and the teams that he's played, and the, the, his best games came against the best teams that he had on the schedule. That's pretty – Cam Hart from Notre Dame. I like Cam Hart a lot. I, I just feel like this is a draft where – and the Lions really need that XY receiver. And I know that, you know, Walter brought up Jamari Thrash. The problem with Jamari Thrash – He's got one of the worst contested catch rates in the in the draft. So he's not a contested catch kind of guy. He drops a lot of footballs. And I look at him and I go, no. I mean, if I'm going to go wide receiver, there's three wide receivers I have in my mind. It's Brian Thomas in the first round. It's Braden Rice from USC. And I know Walter hates this guy because he calls him the drop man. But I really believe that Devontae Walker is one of those guys that could be a legit wide receiver that could be a threat. And a lot of people, they point to this year, and they go, the reason he, he dropped a lot of footballs, part of that was because he came in at the begin, in the middle of the season, and I don't think he was up to up to the standard. We've seen with Jamison Williams, it took him to the NFC Championship game before he finally started to get his legs, finally started to make some contested catches. You got to be in, you got to be in the football shape, and you got to play football to get in that kind of mode. And I felt like that's what happened to Devontae Walker. So, when I look at this team, when I look at the Lions, there's a lot of different ways they can go, obviously, but I think wide receiver and X wide receiver is their, one of their bigger needs in this draft. I don't think they need a guy like uh, Jamari Thrash. I don't think they need a guy like, you know, people bring up Keon Coleman, but his contested catch rate as a big guy is terrible. So, I mean, people can bring up Keon Coleman all they want. I like him as a player because he went to Michigan State and he played at Florida State, which I also like. But Contested catch rate for a big guy is not that great. So Walt brought it. So Walt brought it up, and I'm very curious with the, the last topic that I'm available for before I have to head out. Walt said the name, and it's a very controversial name. I think that one in which it's going to potentially bear out regarding the position and the, the player that plays it. Cooper DeGene is very interesting, and we have to bring it up. There just aren't many successful white defensive backs we have to bring it out there i know we, we look, we have to put it out there because that's one of the biggest knocks on the position is that you, you don't see that too often but there's a lot of factors that make him kind of a, an appealing target for the lions his versatility potentially to be on the the new kickoffs you know that uh, he's got the relationship with jack campbell he told me in the locker room when i asked about him when Cooper gene made the plays in the big 10 and throughout the year i said man Cooper's a special teams wizard. He's like, John, he's like, Cooper DeGene's a dog. And he just had so much respect for his teammate. And I look at it and I say, this guy, a lot of intangibles. He's got a lot of things that Brett Holmes would like. 
I just would be more comfortable if it's between him and, and Kool-Aid McKinstry. I would just say Kool-Aid McKinstry because I think the, the upside's a little higher in regards to the ceiling. Now, I think Cooper DeGene's more ready to start right now than Kool-Aid. And his Kool-Aid is, I think, a guy that you know still has some things to learn at the NFL level. Look, he's a good college player. His tape will be impressive when you look at it. But when you, when you talk about the um, adaptation to the league, I think that's a big, steep learning curve. And for a guy like Cooper DeGene, you can maybe put him in a slot. You can kind of do some things and have him more useful now than maybe a Kool-Aid McKinley who you can stack uh, away for a little later in the season. But to me, if there's one player that would kind of make you have to dig a little bit and be a little concerned is that if the Lions draft Cooper DeGene. Is there anybody besides him? that would make you concerned in the first round. But to me, I think Cooper DeGene is, is, is one name that you will hear tied to the Lions just based on what he brings to the table. Right. Uh, the mm. Cooper, uh, good player. And the, I think the last time was what, uh, Jason Seahorn was the last time a, a white cornerback was drafted in, in the NFL. I mean, um, at least in the first round. Uh, good player. Uh, I, I, I think that Kool-Aid's ceiling is higher at the pro level. I believe that you're right with the, as far as um, that Dejean is ready to start right now. I, I get that. Uh, but I think for me, I would take Kool-Aid just because I think his his ceiling is higher on, at the pro level. What you got, Walt? I think Cooper is a very, very um, polarizing and interesting prospect. Personally, I think he's a boom or bust player. I really do. I think he's athletic. He's very athletic. But when you look at, like, the fact that he didn't really play anybody from a wide receiver standpoint in the Big Ten this year, if you look at just going back in the film and watching him when he did have the opportunity to play in man coverage, he really seems to struggle, even though I don't care about what guys do in these drills because what guys do in these drills don't always show up on the field. And when you watch him on the field, he kind of struggles to run and transition. We actually transition to run. It's kind of stiff. He's really yoked up, really thick body. It's like he he reminds me a lot of Eric Weddle. And this is nothing wrong with it because Eric Weddle turned out to be a damn good player for the Chargers for a long time. And I think Cooper's very scheme dependent. He has to go somewhere where they know how to use him and turn him into a weapon. But we also said that about Isaiah Simmons. Like we've seen a lot of guys who are big time athletes that didn't really truly have any position mastered to the point that you could say coming out of the draft, okay, this is what this guy is. You know, you don't see a lot of those guys. You had the Isaiah Simmons and to go back, I'm gonna date myself a little bit here, but to go all the way back to even RW McCorders with the San Francisco 49ers, like these guys who are big time athletes that didn't really have a position and they tend to struggle when they get to the league trying to actually become something, that's why I've been a very big advocate of, of Travis Hunter at Colorado of playing one position this year. And that's it because you can't go to the NFL to think you're just going to wing it and just learn some, some brand new position on the fly like that is there's examples of it, but it doesn't really happen that much. So like I said, I, I like Cooper. I think he's very scheme dependent. Um, I think anyone who looks at the film, who honestly looked at the film and walked away from it saying that he's the best corner in this class is crazy. And they're being dishonest. Because, you know, it's when you look at it for what it is, some people have a, an agenda to push with him. And I get it. Because I'm going to bring out the elephant in the room. And the fact is this. I think a lot of white people view Cooper DeGene the way black people view Lamar Jackson. In the sense that in regard, regardless of his deficiencies, I'm going to defend him because he's one of my own. And that's nothing, that's not saying anything negative towards black people or white people. I think it's an innate situation a lot of times where people naturally do that. Because I've been talking about Cooper DeGene on social media the past few days, and I never once called him a bad player. I never once called him a bad athlete. But if it seems as if you say anything about him that is not completely glowing, you get attacked by certain people and it's, it's really ridiculous, you know, because like you can't, you're not allowed to evaluate him the way you evaluate all of these other corners. And, you know, you look at how people have brought up his athleticism and 
if you compare his numbers to a lot of guys in this class, it kind of brings him back down to earth. But right. if you compare his numbers to Antrell Roll, or you compare his numbers to Steve Smith or um, Trent McDuffie, like guys who aren't really big time explosive athletes, it's going to look better. So right. I think when you look at like Quinion Mitchell, I think he's clearly better. And you can say he played better talent. He, has, he, he at least played Ohio State. And then Nate Wiggins, I think, is also another dog out there. An, enough versatility. That's my mm-hmm. thing. When you get same thing I felt with the NBA. If you got too many versatile guys, too many guys that can do different things, who the hell is the dog? Right. Who's the shot maker? Who's the guy out there? I want mm-hmm. a number one corner. I, I had enough of versatility. We got versatility with Branch last year. We got right. versatility with Melifonwu. Can we get a legit damn corner that we've never right. had? A number one guy? Like a, enough with the, the versatility stuff. We need a guy that we can change coverages and allow Aaron Glenn to do different things exotically with the secondary, with the real corner. I just, right. it's, we, we've we never had it. Even Darius Slay wasn't a first round pick. Like mm-hmm. en- enough is enough with the, the versatile guy. He's a Swiss army knife and he works hard. And he's a culture guy, like a, enough of that. Let's go get a real legit corner and stop playing around. Okay, I feel you. What you got? Well, on enough. That, enough is enough, man. Let's be <laughs> let's be I real think. about this, man. Enough is enough. We we keep looking for okay guys. Like, well, like I stop news. it. I got news for you. None of these guys are going to be cornerback ones. To be honest, like if you look at, yeah, all these I, guys, I disagree completely. I've seen. There's, I watched only, there's only there's only there's only one or two guys that I see that could potentially be cornerback one guys. And that's a potential thing, and that's that's not going to happen right away because cornerbacks are one of the hardest positions to play. And the second part about it is being a defender now with the new tackle rules is stupid. So here's the thing: I look I look at Terry and Arnold. I think he's going to be a, a, a quarterback a cornerback one. And I look mm-hmm. at uh, Quinton Mitchell, and I look at those two guys, and I say that those are the two separators. That is it. Then you look at Cooper DeGene, and you look at Kule McKinstry, and you look at TJ Tampa from Iowa State or Mikey Sander still from Michigan. Like there's all these these guys that they have certain things that they're good at. Then they have certain things that they're not good at. And I know everyone's bringing up Cooper DeGene because he's white and everything like that. But like here's the thing about Cooper DeGene. I was reading the uh, Raz. He was 28th out of like 3,000 cornerbacks since 1982. So he's 28th out of all those. So he's got the athletic ability. He's got the smarts as a cornerback that you would want because he only allowed two touchdowns at Iowa total, two touchdowns total in three years. I look at Cooper DeGene, I go, okay, if you put him in the right situation, he could obviously thrive. If you put him in a situation where he's asked to be, is asked to be the cornerback one, you're probably going to be in trouble. It's the same with things with Kool-Aid McKinstry. If you, if you ask him to be cornerback one, I can guarantee you this right now. You're gonna be very disappointed, and all these all these fans that that cried about Cam Sutton last year, it's gonna be the same thing with these guys. People just gotta face the facts. You, cornerback wants the, the the guys that are the elite guys in the cornerback position. They're very few and far between. You look at Kansas City. I mean, they got Trent McDuffie and they got Legarius Sneed, but they, they obviously went with Trent McDuffie and they didn't pay Legarius Sneed. Why? Because they can rush the passer. I think rushing the passer is more valuable than a corner. That's my opinion. And if unless 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 you're getting a guy like Patrick Sertan, unless you're getting a guy that you believe can be that cornerback number one, where does why does it matter where you draft him? You see what I'm trying to say? Like well, if you draft him at, if you draft him at 29, cool. What's the expectation for the kid? You move I think up, you move there's up. only two though. I mean, I if you told me I can take two corners out of this class and put them on the island and I'm comfortable with them being my number ones, eventually, am I saying these dudes are going to be Champ Bailey or Charles Woodson from Snap One? No. Everybody has their struggles. They're going to have struggles. All these corners have struggles. But it's not about what you start out as Snap One. It's about what do you eventually become. And I think right. a guy like Terry Arnold – the lack of athleticism showed up at the combine. And I think if, if people are being honest about it, 
if you go back and watch the LSU game, where this is how I view corners. What do you do against the best of the best and these high-end athletes? The level of athleticism was on display and the dis- uh the discrepancy between the athleticism between Malik neighbors and Brian Thomas and Arnold was scary. Like on the perimeter, he looked like he had no answer for those dudes. That's when I started thinking to myself, okay, you know what? Could he be a really good, a really good slot? He could. I like his change of direction skills. His size is somewhat slot corner ish, but at the end of the day, you need elite athleticism on the perimeter. Now, when you look at the DK Metcalfs and the Leggetts, and the Brian Thomases of the world and the Xavier Worthies and the Jameson Williams is out there. Even if you go back in history, all the top corners, not the, the slot guys, the Rondé Barbers of the world or the Santi Samuel guys, the number one corners on the outside were always big time athletes. Mm-hmm. Even you go back to guys like Daryl Green, was he a big time specimen? No, but Daryl Green was a big time athlete. He was a freak. And you can get away with undersized and decent technique from the slot, but when they need you to go outside those numbers and defend these freaks, you need athleticism. That's why I looked at the, I went back and watched the Alabama LSU game twice. And it was on display for me twice that if you're too dude for him, like too athletic, too physical, he can't handle that. Now that doesn't mean Terry Arnold can't be a solid slot corner. Because when I compare him and McKinstry, I think McKinstry is a good football player. Mm-hmm. I think he's more equipped to play on the outside, even now, even though it's not about the size difference, because he's bigger naturally than Terry Arnold. But I believe McKinstry can actually develop and play on the outside. Now, Terry Arnold, you can't just grow athleticism when you get to the league. Sometimes you can be as smart as you want to be. You can watch as much film as you want to watch. Sometimes you get typecast into a certain position, and I kind of think that's what Terry on Arnold is. And Queen Yon Mitchell can play zone. He can play man. There's not too much he can do. He ran the 40 super fast. You saw him do everything he needed to do at the combine. When you go back, you watch the film. It's obvious that, to me, him and Nate Wiggins are two dudes. They're the guys that you can throw out there and guys that can play on the perimeter. Because at the end of the day, like I said, if you don't have the athleticism on the outside, that shit's going to get exposed. And you're going to eventually get moved to the outside. That's why even when people discuss Cooper DeGene, it's more so athlete, athlete, athlete. And smart, and smart, and smart. And it's like smart is always something that's, once again, but smart, and, it's, smart it's, and crafty. Smart and crafty are always two adjectives that are associated with white players, though. Wait, you just brought up athleticism. You said athleticism is crucially important for the the cornerback on the outside. That's what you just said. I'm not talking about just 40 40 times and and just explosion numbers. I'm not not talking about 40 either. But you you obviously need athleticism to be on the outside, correct? Yes. Okay, so Cooper DeGene is athletic. Nate Wiggins is athletic. So here's the thing. I... This is this goes back to my point. The reason look at Terry on Arnold, one of his biggest flaws is he's grabby as hell. That's what that's what the scouting reports say. Because he's what, not athletic. Okay, Non-athletes that, grab. <laughs> that's what they do. That's my effing point. So if how you, was he if, what did you say you had him? QB what cornerback two or uh, three. Uh, three or something? You had him three, as yeah. a QB one. And yeah, he's grabby no, because he's not athletic. I, well, I think I think he's a football player. I don't think he's oh. going to wow you with athleticism. I kind of look at okay. I look at I look at Terry and Arnold. Kind of look. I look at like um, a Bradbury type. Like Bradbury is not athletic at all. He's kind of he's kind of grabby. We know that by the Super Bowl, but he gets the job done. That's kind of what I view him as. Nate Wiggins is another guy who I love. But the problem with him is, and I think he could slip to the lines with his combine injury, but we'll see. But I look at Quinion Mitchell. That's those little three guys that I would say, okay, that's good. But the reason I went draft a cornerback in round one is because I think the you were saying earlier that the that we have to go get this guy. What guy is there? Is there a guy like Patrick Shatan in this this thing? Is there is 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 there a guy like that? Because I don't see it. And Let's I feel be like, real, like. 
we know who I, Pat is now, but people had a lot of doubts about. I didn't, but oh, he's an Alabama corner, and oh, you know, he's not yeah, good well, in that's, man. That's, and that's 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 there was a lot that, of doubt for Pat, that's, but that's what you don't know that. until these guys get here to the league. Well, my point, my point is exactly this: you look at the two Super Bowl teams. Was there like a cornerback on that roster that you go out? You were like, "Yup, that's a that's a dog." No, they both had pass rushes. Well, look how those teams were built, also. I mean, no, no, right. no. Well, what, what the Chiefs had, look, McDuffie's a good player. He's a really good player, and so was right. Jarius Sneed. Now, they didn't have a whole lot individually outside of Chris Jones, if you're talking about the front seven for that team. But that's a very well coached defense with a really good defense coordinator. They're aggressive. They're blitzing. Yes. So, yeah, but, and, but, and they play I, pretty opportunistic. But my point about it is this you said, you know, you were going to the cornerback thing about how you need, they need to go get a dog and everything like that. And I, I totally agree with you. But the problem is, I don't see that guy in this draft, man. Like, I don't see a guy in this draft that you go, like, I, I look at these cornerbacks come out of college and I feel like that they are, their rules in college prohibit them from learning how to play NFL ball. Let me ask you this. So, what is your issue with Quinn Yon Mitchell then? I like Quinn Yon Mitchell. Would it be no, better if he had a had an A on his helmet? No. You see, I, <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like Cooper DeGene and I feel like Quentin Yon Mitchell get this 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 uh aspersion casted at them because they played at Toledo and because one of them played in Iowa at the Big Ten West, which Big Ten West is garbage, but we know how it is. I think they both get the same the same treatment, in my opinion. Because who'd you play? But then you look at Nate Wiggins and you go, okay, who did he play? Yeah, you know I think sometimes you just look at the, the skill set. So, like, Nate Wiggins, when you watch Nate Wiggins play, even before he ran at the combine, I told people he was cracking for two. Right. Like, some guys on the field, you can see, like, there's not just, oh, he ran fast at the combine, but it doesn't show up on film. Now, my issue with Nate Wiggins is the size. You know, is he going to fill out some? Can he at least get the 190, maybe 195? But if you're talking about somebody that, that's a dog, like we, we throw the word dog around a lot. If you're talking about a corner out there that plays with an attitude, that plays confident, that goes for the football, goes for the big plays, is willing to throw his body around and run support, can go out there, is fast enough to bait. Like you can do so much with a guy that's as athletic as Nate Wiggins. Now... We can go keep going, getting these nice little Jerry Jacobs guys or whatever guys that are versatile and can do a bunch of stuff, but doesn't really specialize in anything at all. But I mean, listen, there's been some misses on the specimens. I get it. You got a guy like CJ Henderson from Florida, six foot two oh five, bench two hundred, but bench four hundred pounds, ran four three, had forty plus inch vertical, and turned out to be nothing. But you can say that about pretty much any position. You look at the last few guys who were considered to be the top corners, other than Kyer Elam that one year. Um, what's his name from LSU? Um, Derek, Derek Stingley. Stingley turned out yeah, to be a pretty yeah. good player. Um, Sauce, he's turned out to be pretty good. For the most part, the guys who are deemed as the guys, the skill sets, the eye test can be wrong sometimes. But sometimes you can just get that feel and that vision with some of these dudes. Now, could I be completely wrong? And sure. I thought CJ Henderson was going to be a damn good player. Didn't turn out to be that way. For whatever reasons, I don't know. Some guys just don't translate to the NFL that well. But I'm just saying, I, it all depends on how you built. And if it's you can't, just, I'm just saying that 29. But if yeah. you're going to trade up, you want to make sure you trade enough for an elite talent. I yeah. don't think they're going to trade up for an edge rusher. I really don't. I, I'm with yeah. you. I think if they do trade up, it could be for a wide receiver. I, I don't mean, if, think. If Jared Verse is on the board, I think they would think. Well, him it. too. Him too. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. I think he's a guy, high ceiling player. Not high ceiling, yeah. but a high floor player. You yeah. know how people feel, pretty much feel about those guys now. Hey, you know, he's a finished product. I don't like him and this and that. But he's a guy I think could step right in with what we good. have in place and mm -hmm. be an eight, nine sack guy. From year See, the, one, the issue, you know, you brought up the corner, but I, I'm just going to go back to this for a minute. But my ideology thinking is like, if you look at the cornerback position, I think it's getting kind of towed down by the way that the NFL calls the defense now. You know, like I think that you look at the defense, and you, I think it's more important to have a cornerback that can tackle well than 
be good in coverage. I think that's going to be the major thing. Like going forward, I think that like, you know, got like I was, you know, we were talking with the Rams. They there was a lot of yak yards that they allowed in in, in the Lions game. You know, we talk about like you, one of the reasons I did like Carlton Davis in that trade is low yak. Him and Jamel Dean, they did a both. They did a damn good job. Now their safety that they have, what's his? I'm forgetting his name. The safety Winfield. Winfield. He was elite. He was great. So is Brian Branch this year, but it. I think it's more important for a court, a corner to tackle to make that tackle when he when he the guy catches the ball more than being good in coverage because I feel like this league is going so far where even if you just touch the wide receiver they're gonna call pass interference so that's my thinking with the cornerback position to be honest. No, it's strange. Oh, kind of strange because if you look at the Lions' defense from last year. The one glaring weakness was the pass coverage. Yep. And it was consistently one guy. You know, you got Keenan Allen with 11 plus catches and CDs. And now, at the end of the day, these teams didn't, they barely cracked 20 points against us. It was set with the Chargers. But I think if you, we played defensively, play overall well, I felt. I thought that Aaron Glenn took a lot of, some heat was due and some heat was just piling on, I felt. But I felt overall they played decent as a defense. If we just think about where this defense could have ranked a year ago if we had better cornerback play. Let's say we did have a Patrick Sertain. Let's say they did trade for a Sertain at the at the deadline. I don't see Sertain getting fried like that for six straight weeks. I think with this pass rush, because it was kind of limited, I thought outside of Lee McNeil and outside of Aiden Hudson, there was no pass rush to be available. So I feel like if you don't get pass rush on the quarterback, what it's going to do is the quarterback is going to just sit there back there all day. And he's going to, if you give a a quarterback in this league five seconds to throw the ball, they're going to beat you every time. And if it's a CD lamb, he's going to get open earlier. If it's a Keenan Allen, he's a great route runner. He's going to get open earlier. That's why when you guys were talking about Darius Robinson. If it's uh, anybody against us, he's going to get open earlier. Well, it was well, D- DJ I, Moore. It was it was a it was a lot of guys, so, man. That's what don't, I'm saying. Don't, I, let's not bring up JJ. We we are let's not even bring up JJ at all. My point about it though is like I feel like the pass rush is more at fault than the cornerbacks. Because I feel like late in the year they had the blitz to get a pass rush, which if you blitz quarterbacks like good quarterbacks they're gonna burn you like we were lucky that we in the playoffs that we played stafford which he's not a guy that can get outside the pocket barely uh baker mayfield who's not good against he's not good against the blitz and then you had brock purdy and brock purdy exploited them when they kind of moved him around in the in the second half that's why i kind of go with this whole you need someone that can rush the passer that's the main thing and it doesn't really have to be in the first round you can go Jalen Harrell, who has a great went pass rush win rate at you know Michigan. Another Wolverine uh, slappy. No, no, I'm, no, I'm joking. I'm, I'm joking. I don't even like Michigan, but I'm, I'm joking. He's, man. he's a dog. Like I, here's the thing: when I look at when I look at these defensive ends, I look at their pass rush win rate, especially if they're in the SEC or the Big Ten or the Pac-12. Well, the Pac-12 doesn't exist after this year, but you get my drift. Like any any uh, Big Ten. You know, conference. You look at him and you go, "Okay, this guy could rush a passer. He might not be good in run. His run grade might not be great, or his, you know, he might not be good against the run. But I could throw him out there in the pass, and he can go rush the passer. And that's that's what I that's what I look at with this man. Like I don't look at the corners. Like I don't I don't think I don't think you need a number one corner in this 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 era this new era of NFL, in my opinion, with the new tackling rules, with the way they call. Well, it defense. helps to have a really good corner. Can I we mean, agree on that? It, it helps to have a Darrell Reeves. Like, I mean, you, it helps to have a, a really good corner. Okay, you're building a team right now. Would you take a number one corner or a, a legit defensive end edge rusher? Well, I mean, of, of course you're going to take the, the edge rusher. If we're talking about, okay, so you can argue in a vacuum who's the best corner. Not corner, right. but who, yeah, that too. But who's the best edge rusher? Is it Miles Garrett, Bosa, TJ sure. White, or whatever? Or do I want – who's the best corner in the, in the league? Uh a, a Ramsey or, or whoever, or Sauce or whatever. Of course, yeah. I'm gonna take Miles Garrett. Yeah. Of course, I'm gonna take T.J. Watt because those sacks. I understand what the court the corner does in coverage, but I think it all comes down to how you're built as a team. 
Now, for us, unless we're going to get somebody that can really get after the quarterback, it's going to be hard. But you still need guys out there, out there that can cover. Now, heading into 2024, we got Carlton Davis. We expect him to be an upgrade and play better for us than what we had a year ago. They brought back Vildor, who I actually thought played decent for us, but he's just remembered by the, the face mask. Uh, Blown <laughs> Blown playing is, is bad because he actually played decent. He had yeah, some he decent did. games for us, but that's what he's going to be remembered for. But Amik Robertson. So, yeah, you know, we, we got guys that can help out, but I still think it helps if you can have that number one corner. And to go back to a, a few segments ago when we were discussing uh, – Jackson Powers Johnson or Darius Robinson. It just feels like to me when you look at the, the hit rate and bus rate on those type of edge rushers, those supersized guys we saw, not to say he's a bust, but um Morris. Mike Morris from Michigan a year yeah. ago, Keon White, like those guys. I, don't I think, think we still good. fall in love. We fall in love with those supersized edge rushers. No, I think a he- lot. The guy who's six six, I mean six five, two ninety five, and can play some three tech and play some five, whatever. I just think we've seen so many of those guys. Now we look at the hit rate on the centers. The last five to six, seven centers that have been drafted in the first round, aside from Caesar Ruiz, and you can argue how you feel about Cam Irving who went to Cleveland. Aside of aside from those two guys right there, you're talking about Linderbaum, you're talking about Ragnow. Um, Bradbury, who was pretty good for the Minnesota Vikings, the miss rate on those centers in the first round isn't really that low. I just think that we've seen so many Darius Robinsons before. And then you look at the age, the amount of time he played. and it's, If I have the ability to get the elite prospect, me and myself, I have to go and get it. And it's not the sexy pick at all. But I think you were talking about investing money in golf. You want to make sure, aside from Panay Sewell, that you have that offensive line intact completely. That's why I kept bringing up the fact that offensive line could be two of the first three picks because that level of talent could still be there. Now, we don't know how they feel about Mahogany from Boston College or Chris Haynes from UConn, Cooper BB from Kansas State. We don't know. We don't know if they feel Bo Limerick can play guard. Yeah. <laughs> For all we know. So there's so much talent there. And the miss rate on a lot of these players lately just isn't the way it is when it comes to these edge rushers. Not to say that Robinson can't do it. No, the reason I look at Darius Robinson is um, there's there's a couple of things. Number one, I, I I think when you look at a defensive end, you have to put it into the, the team that you got. So I look at a team like with Detroit with DJ Reader, who's going to uh, take blocks away. Look at a guy like Elaine McNeil who's going to take blocks away. I think that you would literally put Darius Robinson one-on-one and can he win that one-on-one matchup? I think he can. I think um, it just, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fit. And if, if this guy gets me eight, nine sacks and he, he allows you know Hutch to get free or Aleem to get free, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I think that is the most kind of the best way to go about it because I know Jackson Powers Johnson is a great – he's a great player. I love Jackson Powers Johnson. The issue I have with it is I think there are some centers that can be had late in the draft. Is that Frazier? Yeah, like, you know, you got, like, the the kid from Wisconsin, Bolini or whatever his yeah. name is. I like him. I like the kid from um, NC State. I think he could, be a, he could be polished a little bit. I just look at some of these guys and I go, there's definitely some – and if Brett Holmes wants to go best player available, you know, if he wants to go that best, best player available – I think late in the draft he can go after those guys like with a need, and maybe Jackson Powers Johnson is is his best available, or maybe it's Darius Robinson. But I just think you look at this team and you go, okay, who can I put next to DJ Reader because that's the side that he'd be playing on, and wh- how would it how would it work? You know, and everyone brings up Chop Robinson, but I've said for no, okay, well here's the problem, Walt. Well, these people are falling in love with Chop Robinson. They fall in love with Chop Robinson. And he was, he was said, on the freaks list. Well, I said, okay. I said, <laughs> on, my, <laughs> I said on my podcast a couple a, a week ago, I said, what you trying to do? Raise a daycare of short defensive ends? You know, that are undersized? You know, like Houston, he's a smaller defensive end. You don't need another smaller defensive end. Like, you already got one. 
You know, usually these teams in the NFL, they have one of those undersized defensive ends. You don't need two. Like we saw what James Houston happened to James Houston in that in that 49ers game. Trent Williams put him in a headlock. And well, that's the thing. We we it. honestly we don't know about Houston. I think a lot of us as fans are still living off hope, envisioning well, what we saw those final handful of games a year ago. Like he's got my, a lot to prove when he comes back. And Houston's not enough for me to pass on a, an undersized. Well, I don't view Dallas Turner as an undersized edge rusher. Well, I think he's all. a different. I think he's a different type of edge rusher. But I yeah. think if I, I think the reason I like Darius Robinson is I feel like with all that beef that you have between Reader and McNeil and Robinson, I feel like there's teams that are gonna leave they're gonna have to, they're gonna have to leave someone one on one with the you know if they leave if Hutch one on one or Aleem or DJ like they're gonna get to the passer. So I just I, Darius Robinson his pass rush win rate was like eighteen percent. His best games came against some of the best tackles in that conference, which is SEC. I just feel like that's a good pick. Like I I think that a lot of people they look at the big size and they go, yeah, that's what I like. That's the old school defensive He's a hall of famer. Here. But it's oh, I, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be like that. It just it's the right fit kind of like. No, no, I, I get it. I don't think at twenty nine there's too many. Um... I just feel like as a fan, you can't sit there and say right now at 29, there's a bad direction to go. No. Like they could see anything. They could see the, and we haven't spoke about this because safety is a need. They have the ability at 29. If they choose to, we know that Tyler Newbin from Minnesota has met with Green Bay multiple times now. I had him actually mock the Green Bay a few weeks ago. Um, 6'2, 212, really fast safety. Can play some cover one, can play cover three. Very smart, very opportunistic ball skills. Like he's kind of that Darren Sharper. I don't want to go Ed Reed, but he's sort of that that Darren Sharper. Bef- well, before we found out the truth, but he, he's sort of that Darren we Sharper. Talk about that. <laughs> the, he he's the good Darren Sharper. He's he's so he's sort of that good Darren Sharper. That guy who was just a ball magnet. I yeah. remember watching Darren Sharper as a as a Lions fan. When he first came, his first preseason game in Green Bay, and this dude was dropping interceptions left and right, and I'm like, this dude gonna be special, because he was always around the football, and that's kind of like what I see with Tyler Newbin. I think a guy like Newbin is an option because, depending on what you want to do with Joseph, Joseph may not play up to snuff this season. He may play up to snuff enough, but you may not want to break the bank for him. Mm-hmm. A guy like Newbin enables you to do a whole lot. You can actually keep Branch at nickel. Carlton is good where he's at. Now, what are you going to do as the number two corner? You know, Sutton's gone, so we still have that up in there. I'm not sure Meek Robinson is my number two. But I just think a guy like a guy like him could be – he can be that guy on the back end that changes games and really yep. erases things for you and – that helps too. I just I'm a firm believer in building the defense. You still need at least one game changer at all three levels. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a corner or a safety. Theoretically, you will like that. You will like someone in the secondary that can make game changing plays. You want a linebacker or an edge rusher, with depending on whether you're a three, four, or four, three, or whatever. And you want typically someone on the defensive line that can wreck games, whether it's a game wrecking nose tackle, a three tech or an edge rusher. And I don't think there's any bad uh, directions they can go unless they took Michael Penix or, or, or Bo Nix or something like that, or took another damn tight end. Brock Bowers. Like, like this is what I'm saying. Because we've heard the Brock Bowers rumors over the past oh, week man. or so. Me, me and you would have went at it because I was saying on my the podcast a couple a week ago, if Brock Bowers got the 21, would you trade up and do it? And I, Who else is I, on the board? I think I would because well, here, him and him and Brian Thomas are both on the board. Give me Brock Bowers. You said we need an X. You lie. Well, here's what here's my thinking around this. Okay, so people look at Brock Bowers. I think Brock Bowers is, is going to be like an elite tight end. I really do. We got one. But here's the thing: with his new tackling rules, you can't tackle these guys the same as you used to. So. If I got two of those big guys, what the hell are you going to do? I got St. Brown coming through the slot. I got J-Mo running a fly route. I got Gibbs coming out of the backfield. We know they ran the two tight end sets the most in the NFL. So I was like, why not? Like, why not? If he's the best player available, go ahead. Fine, I'm good with it. But, like, 
I just, man, you can go. I think the Lions can go any way in this draft. I really do. Like, a, I even like a Peyton Wilson, the kid from NC State. I think he's he could be on the board. I think that you could use someone like him. I'm As kind of in, yeah. I'm kind of intrigued by this. Well, I, I didn't like some of his film, but TJ Tampa from Iowa State. He's a tall, he's 6'2, 200 pounds. So he's that, you know, he's that big corner that you was talking about. But I just feel like, I feel like he's got unhidden talent. You know what I'm saying? Because he went to Iowa State. I think a lot of team, a lot of people look, overlook Iowa State as like some, like, you know. No, they of, put a decent amount of guys in the NFL. You know, Purdy was one of them. Uh, Wasn't Will McDonald? He, he was a first round yeah. pick last year too. Montgomery was one of them. You know they got they got some dogs over. A couple there, wide so. receivers. Yeah, a Kohler was a tackle. Kohler from the tight end was there from there. They had a couple of defensive players, but they never really panned out. But one thing I didn't like about TJ Tampa is he does get turned around a lot. But that is what it is. But I do like the one one cornerback that I do like though. I, I, okay. It's Mikey Sanders, so I do I do think oh. Sanders is gonna be the guy, man. I do think yeah. he's gonna be do. Are there any Spartans even in the draft, man? No, no. Next year, probably, yeah. Next year. All right, Darcy. Let's wrap this up. Next year, you probably got that center coming out. That the uh, center that transferred over there. See, I, I'm with all my garb here. I'm usually looking to find. I'm always the best looking podcaster. You cut your hair. It's different now. Like, well, it's just yeah. different. They, they said it, I look like 20 years younger. So Yeah, now you look like now you look like uh now you look like uh you look like Darcy the executive, you know? Like you there don't you even... go. There you go. I like uh, Darcy the catcher yeah. singer better. So we're at 45 viewers. This is a uh, kind of a record. We got two comments here. I'm the pro- producer. Uh I Joe and I have known each other for like 11 years. He was a little snot snows kid yep. jumping over the uh, in Holland Park and going through the fence. And Joe, I, 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 I love it. Uh, you've done so well. You're at 76,000 Six. yeah, yeah. followers. Six. Yeah, uh, I've been doing the show. This is the third episode. Walter Stringer is going to be in. Um, um, Where's the draft the or the Super Bowl again? Sorry, I'm not used to having this on here. Can't hear myself. Next year's Super Bowl, or are you talking about the actual NFL draft? No, no, no. Next year's uh, Super Bowl. It's in the Saints, New Orleans. New Orleans so, yeah. I predict that uh, Walter's going to be there. Uh, thanks for uh, you know everybody watching the show. It's been great. We had Glover Quinn on. We've had nine former players on. Joe is on. He's always first, and Walter is the best. Uh, I love you guys. Um, what the hell? Don't you love me back or no? Yeah, we do. We do. Oh, yeah. yeah you Welcome okay. to the Detroit Lions News Show. Your number one source for Detroit Lions News. But when I see Dan Campbell.